Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, and I'm your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The uh, Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is my panelist, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MA from Tufts, an MBA from Wharton, Rick was retired from the investment banking industry, is now a venture capitalist. Thanks for being with us, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature and concepts in current media and explicate their essence and explore to see if they're being used properly. This week, our topic is an, from an article in the Wall Street Journal on February 25th, 2013, entitled Head Start for All, Universal Preschool and a Government that Won't Admit Failure. So the real topic here is, why does the government fail? What is the nature of government failure? Why doesn't it do much very well? So let's go into the article see what it has to say in some of its highlights, and then we'll go and try and figure out the nature of government and why government can't do many things well. The article starts out by saying the government failure is hardly new. In our new progressive era, no program can ever end because the only reason government fails is that there wasn't enough government in the first place. The 2000 stimulus, uh, excuse me, the 2009 stimulus, the greatest burst of spending in 30 years, produced the worst recovery in 80 years. So therefore, we now need even more spending. The economy requires QE infinity because it is still too weak despite years of historic monetary easing. The entitlement state is dis dysfunctional and unaffordable, so add another entitlement. There may not be a better illustration of this contradiction between intentions and results than Mr. Obama's new demand for free universal preschool. The article goes on, speaking last week in Decatur, Georgia. Mr. Obama said that education has to start at the earliest possible age and cited study after study that purport to show public preschool for every child results in lasting academic gains and other cognitive and social improvements. Later on in the article, it says, for this reason, what study after study really suggests is that government-funded pre-K programs are best when they are targeted at low-income, disadvantaged, or minority children, those with the most need. Such a modest, practical reform may lack Mr. Obama's preferred political grandeur. But the other reason he didn't propose it is that the government has already been doing it for half a century. That would be Lyndon Johnson's Head Start program, birth date 1965. In December of last year, the Human, the Health and Human Sources Department, the, the Health and Human Services Department, released the most comprehensive study of Head Start to date, which took years to prepare. The 346-page report followed toddlers who won lotteries to join Head Start in several states and those who didn't through the third grade. There were no measurable differences between the two groups across 47 outcome measures. In other words, Head Start's impact is no better than random. 
Counting Head Start, special education and state subsidized preschool, 42% of four-year-olds are now enrolled in a government program. Federal, state, and local financing for early learning is closing in on $40 billion a year, double what it was a decade ago. But can anyone say that achievement is twice as good or even as good? The article concludes, government expands without results. So why is that? Let's explore. <clears throat> First of all, the government, when it produces a product, and it does produce some products. For example, it has a judicial product. It, it has defense for the nation. It, it, has, uh, it produces an infrastructure. It produces the post office. These are products that the government is, uh, that puts out and, and is producing. And these are partial monopolies. It's not a total monopoly, but they're partial. Can't, in some instances, you can't really compete with the post office because you're not allowed to put other letters besides postal letters into a mailbox. But the private sector does compete somewhat with UPS and Federal Express and their overnight deliveries, door to door. There is some competition for the post office. So it has some efficiency. It's not bad. It loses, but probably that's because Congress steps in and does certain things that doesn't allow it to act competitively. But not bad. Infrastructure, we spend a lot of money on it, but not bad. We get a pretty reasonable product. Defense, obviously, a great product. The, the judiciary, pretty good product. OK, so sometimes government does produce good products. But in each case, there's a, it's a partial monopoly, a monopoly. For example, sometimes private companies go to negotiate by themselves. Defense is not entirely government owned. Most of the products come from private enterprise. And thus, thus the Defense Department buys from private enterprise. And thus, all their products are very efficiently produced. But in those areas where the government has a complete monopoly, such as in entitlements and welfare and transfer payments of any kind, and not only to individuals but to corporations also, there's corporate welfare as well as individual transfer payments. And the government divides these up to government charity, that is the welfare, and which probably is about 85% inefficient. That is, a dollar that goes into this program, only maybe 15 cents gets to the end user. But the government also uses private charities to effect some of the services that uh, are needed or that the government outsources, literally outsources some of its charity to private charity who, spe who do have some specialties, like uh, there are some soup kitchens and uh, uh, homes for the homeless that are operated by private charity. Probably a pretty good, they probably do a pretty good job. But in private business, they produce products for the consumers. And what they're trying to do is fill a demand. And they demand that which is good for themselves. So a consumer, when he goes down to a store, he's looking for that which, is, which will help improve his life. And all those products that are at stores or whatever marketplace that they, the consumers go to buy, generally there's competition. That is, there are several companies vying for the consumer's attention to fulfill the consumer's demand for that which is good for himself. And thus, those companies have priorities 
to fulfill that demand, to fulfill the consumer's want of that which is good. So they produce good products. It is as uh, uh, Frederick Basquiat said, uh, the, uh, the French philosopher, we produce first in order to fulfill demand. So this is what the private marketplace does. And it is without, in general, without a monopoly, and thus it is very efficient. And so when a government, when a government, when a government has a, has to have a bureaucracy in order to effect its payments to whatever products, for, for, for example, welfare, or to fulfill that product that, such as defense and judicial, or to fulfill transfer payments, which is a product, it fills the demand that is created in society. And it's got, but that entitlement production of product is generally about 85 percent inefficient. Now in the private enterprise, when we get to the product here, and sometimes if there's a profit, governments or private enterprise will invest that and make new corporations which provide new co uh, products and they sacrifice their investment to produce new products through their risk, their time, their effort, their knowledge to create new products and fulfill new demands and new goodness and present new goodness to society. Well, along this way, they have the priority of fulfilling a new demand. Let's say it's a new drug. So that new drug enters the marketplace, it might not have competition yet. And when you don't have competition, the company's priority itself, it assigns to itself a high priority because it had cost to invest and cost to, uh, uh, to develop the product. And then it wants a nice profit for that. And so its priority is very high, and so it charges a little bit higher. But later on, when another company comes in to fulfill that same demand and there's competition, the mature product, instead of going from a new product to a mature product, there's competition. This creates an equilibrium between the priorities of the demand and the fulfillment of the demand. And thus, you lower the price because there's a battle for price, in price negotiation in delivering that product. The government generally doesn't have that situation. So there, that priority balance in competition is not present in the government products that it delivers to society for the most part. As we see back here, there are two sides to government products, the monopoly side and the partial monopoly side. So this side is somewhat efficient. This side is totally inefficient. So let's go to discuss this with, uh, with Rick and see what he has to say about government failure. Rick, any comments? Well, I guess my first observation would be, based on my experience, you know, a number of years ago, uh, working inside of a, a government-affiliated institution, is that there's a kind of budget mentality uh, when you're working for the government uh, that is pervasive. And what I mean by that is uh, the focus for many managers within the government is on expanding their number of uh, direct reports employees, expanding their budget, um, and that 
is what they primarily associate with their status. In other words, the, the, the view on success inside of the government is more associated with size and reach rather than uh, any measure of uh, profit uh, and frankly, the results uh, are never couched in, 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 in terms of efficiency, or very, very rarely. So if you talk to your average government administrator, uh, he wouldn't normally think of reducing his staff in order to deliver a more efficient service as a sign of success. Rather, he would tend to view a larger budget with more staff members as a primary sign of success, that he's been recognized as somehow successful in what he's doing, therefore been given more resources. So from the get-go with, with, with the government, the mentality that it um, perpetuates uh, argues against uh, the kinds of discipline uh, and focus, uh, market focus, product focus, uh, efficiency focus that you normally find in successful business enterprises. Uh, and that's why you never hear or rarely ever hear about government agencies shrinking themselves uh, uh, for the benefit of the ultimate recipients of whatever their service uh, happens to be. There may be one or two examples out there, but uh, they're certainly very, very rare. Uh, so that, that, that's the number one point. Um, number two, in respect of the, the Wall Street Journal article on, on Head Start, I actually had some direct experience uh, working in a um, uh, daycare and facility development public corporation when I was much younger that actually sponsored a Head Start program. Um, and none of the results that the Wall Street Journal mentions uh, particularly surprised me, um, uh, even if there are surely instances where underprivileged children have been helped. All right, let's just accept that. But then, of course, there have been numerous instances where underprivileged children have been helped by churches and uh, private organizations as well. It doesn't have to be delivered by the government. Uh, but what I would come to uh, in terms of achieving educational success, the, 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 the model I would be looking at is the one that is most successful. And frankly, uh, to be utterly politically incorrect, it's primarily ethnic. All right. If you look at the ethnic groups that have been successful uh, in promoting educational achievement in the United States, it is very, very obvious there are two groups that stand out, leaving the broader Caucasian population aside. The first are Asians. Right now, if you look at the uh, student body of any of the elite universities, you'll find the percentage of Asian students ranges from 15 up to something like 20, and sometimes 30 percent uh, in the California school. Okay, so why is that? That, to me, is the first question that governments should be asking. Why is this particular group of people uh, achieving at a very, very high level out of all proportion to the representation of the population? Does it have anything to do with what they've been provided by the government? And I would argue that it absolutely has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with how their families intercede and in how their education is managed. It has everything to do with the harsh discipline imposed by Asian families on their children to ensure that they uh, succeed in school. It's not uh, by being more creative. It's not by uh, enrolling in some specific government program. 
it's because their parents watch over them very, very carefully and ensure that they do their homework. Jewish kids tend to be similar in that respect. So you've got two di different ethnic groups that have succeeded educationally out of all proportion to their representation in the population, but this has little, if anything, to do with government intervention. So actually, you're, uh, I, I can almost conclude that the government is displacing the, the, the parental culture to producing in, in producing its results in the sense that this group, one group doesn't do well. Uh, perhaps the government is stepping in, taking over the parental responsibilities, whereas the other group is doing very well, doesn't need something like Head Start or the various governmental programs because its culture is producing success. Is, this, is it that the government is supplanting some of these cultures within the American society? I think that's the, uh, you know, the path to hell, you know, paved with good intentions. I, and this is a clear case of that. Uh, but what's very instructive is the, the degree to which a, it's a familial structure that drives the success of these two groups. And, you know, and by the way, you know, the Asians are, are a diverse group within themselves, whether they're Indians or Japanese or Koreans or Chinese. This is a diverse group, but there are similarities uh, in terms of how the families um, orient themselves and orient their the sacrifices they make in order to uh, ensure that their children are are more successful than they are. And it's not the government. They they, they deliberately don't rely on the government, but rather on. Uh, tried and true familial based uh, discipline uh, to achieve this success, which is dem demonstrable. Any suggestions for society? I mean, obviously, government is failing at this task as well as many other tasks, but this one in specific. What should we do? What should American society do on, for this, for its educational problems? It's obviously, I read somewhere that it was like 80% the other day, 80% of those who graduate from New York City high schools can't read. It's total failure. How can this be rectified? Any suggestions? Well, I think one place to start um, is that any of the government policies that undermine the nuclear family structure obviously don't help. Uh, and there are many, many policies out there. Um, w welfare is one of them, by the way, uh, because uh, historically uh, in, 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 in urban ghettos, for example, uh, it's actually been beneficial monetarily uh, not to be married and to have children uh, in order to gain more benefits. That's less true than it was in the past. But, but the point is, anything that discourages the, um, the development that, and, and the uh, growth and flourishing of the nuclear family is not going to help uh, in terms of educational achievement. That's where it starts, within the nuclear family. And so there are a whole, uh, there's not enough time to go through all the government policies that are generally uh, inspired by uh, liberal good intentions that discourage and actually mitigate against uh, or, or actually um, um, undermine uh, the continuance of the nuclear family. And we're seeing that in terms of uh, the high incidence of uh, single parents, 
uh, the high incidence of uh, teen and, and, and 20 something births, um, all of this. Am I to assume that you're, got, you're, you're actually concluding that government entitlement state is interrupting the, the progression of family culture? Yes. Yes, I, I, I think there's a, a clear uh, case for accusing the government of undermining um, religious foundations, uh, which are also uh, a means of uh, supporting the nuclear family, of uh, undermining the nuclear family itself, uh, and rather relying on government-inspired uh, one-size-fits-all solutions that have been proven not to work, uh, certainly most spectacularly in education, but also in other uh, areas as well, uh, all to the expense of the future of, uh, you know, American children. Wow. wow. A, uh, a uh, fantastic and great conclusion that all the money we're spending is really more destructive than it is progressive in its nature to produce good for that for the society of, uh, of America. Well, we're, uh, we're out of time for this week, and this is such a large t uh, subject, I think we need to uh, circle back in the coming weeks and uh, revisit it. So thank you for joining The Philosophical Angle, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.